we were fun-loving lads. It was just like young people growing up together. But in the end, um, we were the Busby Bays. But we didn't feel we were the Busby Bays. We, we, we felt we were a team of lads, a team of pals. Busby had great ambitions for his teenage team. They had won the championship. Now he wanted to take them further. The Football League had stopped Chelsea entering the first European Cup. Matt would be more determined. I think that a lot of chairmen, and particularly the management committee, they lived in their own little world. They were Eurosceptics. And I think that uh, they didn't want to be bothered with a lot of foreigners who were, you know, coming over here and trying to be clever. And I think that they, they just did not have the vision to see that it was opening a door both for showing our lads the technical skills that they needed to know and also the fact that it could be a marvellous money spinner for the best clubs. It was just a natural progression. We had to go that way. So I never doubted it for a moment, you know, that it was right. And I've never doubted for a moment that it was right. It was because the old man said, that's the way we've got to go. And if we have to argue with our own football authorities to actually make sure that it happens, then so be it. Matt Busby did the unthinkable. He went to war with the Football League and won. The Babes would be the first to play in Europe. I found it a tremendous and exciting prospect. And I felt, as Northerners do, that London were away behind the times, that Chelsea had turned down the chance of going into Europe. It took the, a Northern team to have the bravery to do it. I remember everybody was really excited about the fact that they were going to play overseas. Because it was completely strange. There was no television. We didn't, we didn't see Spanish football or French football or German football or whatever. Uh, so the only way you could find out was to play against them. It was just a great adventure. were the first English team in Europe. The idea of flying to Bilbao for a match seemed incredible. It was another world for players and supporters. Spain and all the places, it was foreign, it was like on a different planet. We, we'd never been there. We might have seen them on the pictures, like, you know, uh, where it's always sun shining and people are drinking there and uh, they're lying and swimming in the sea and all that. Well, we couldn't do that. So for Manchester United to go into Europe, it was a wonderful adventure. It was fantastic. It was like the voyage of Sinbad. It was very cold. We were expecting northern Spain it to be sunny, but it was in the, the time when uh, the winter and uh, they, they had snow there. It was all completely different. The way the loudspeakers going with uh, Spanish giving the team information. And then uh, the tom toms, the drums, or the roar was different. The Spanish roar was uh, like it is now, still different than an English roar. When somebody's had a shot, it's a whoosh. Where it was felt different, there was a roar with us. Everybody roaring, where it was a roar with them. I thought, oh, we're in real trouble because um, they'd scored the fifth goal to make it 5-2. Five, five and then Bill Whelan picked up a ball. And picture it, very heavy, lads struggling to move, getting late in the game, 5-2 down, he unleashed a 20-odd yarder. Flew, flew in the net. A wonder goal. We've got a hell of a chance here. And it lifted everybody's spirit. The story of Manchester United's young heroes battling away in Europe was big news. The papers fueled the public's imagination. These newspapers must have made a fortune in them days because they'd be buying every newspaper, not one, they'd buy all the lot to read about how Manchester United had done in Europe. And there was nothing nasty. 
There was nothing like you read today. This fella's knocking about with the Spice Woman and this fella's going with the River Dancer Woman and all this time. There was none of that. The worst thing that they ever did was Duncan Edwards bought this bike, a rally bike it was, and he went in without lights and he got fined 10 shillings and Busby fined him two weeks' wages because he'd taken the name of Manchester United into a court. In your dreams, you joined United at 15 as an apprentice, got in the first team at 16, and played for England at 18. It came true for Duncan Edwards. Duncan, first of all, he was a star who didn't act like a star. He act like just one of us. We became internationals, we became stars. Bobby Charlton, the world famous star, and he will tell you he couldn't match the great Duncan Edwards. He's fast, strong, tough, passed the ball, brave, head the ball, you know, and, and, and head really decisive goals, you know. Lived, lived the game, you know. And he, he, would, he would break teams. He could break teams himself individually. If one goal down, he'd say, well, don't worry, Walter, at half-time. He'd say, Walter, don't worry, I'll, I'll get a goal for you in the second half. You know, he had this confidence in himself and in the team. Brian Douglas pulls a smart one back to Duncan Edwards, who bangs it home. With only seven minutes to go, Edwards got the ball, saw his chance and whammed it home from 25 yards up. So England won 2-1. He used to run out like and he'd jump and start doing this try uh, imagine uh, jump into head an imaginary ball that wasn't there but it was fantastic and he'd be running on the spot and he'd do these exercises he was the first man that ever did that the rest of them used to just run out as though they'd just come out of a, a pub or something and then he'd roll his sleeves up push his sleeves up and then he'd uh, turn his top of his shorts right down like that as he could uh, have his thighs Free, you know, as he could kick well. So the fat him. <laughs> In the 50s, even Duncan Edwards had to do national service. He played for the Army and United. They released him to play in the return game in Manchester against Bilbao. Bobby was not so lucky. One of my sergeant majors asked me if I was going to the match. I said, I'm not going to I'm doing national service. And he said, oh, I'd love to go to the game, you know, the game, this was the, the Bilbao game. And I said, well... I'd love to go as well, you know, but I'm stuck here. And he says, if I, if I can arrange it, he says, he says, can we go? So, ooh, I said, yeah, I said, I can get tickets. I'll get the tickets. So uh, we went up to see the Bilbao match, which is, anybody at that particular time will remember, it was an unbelievable experience. I was at Main Road that night, and I remember it, and it was the most pulsating, tense occasion that I have ever been in. I've had four children. And my wife's insisted at every one that I had to be there at a better side. <laughs> it wasn't my choice, I can tell you. And that night at Main Road was so similar to that night when my four children was all born. That's how pulsating it was. Floodlights at Main Road, Manchester. Having lost 3-5 in Bilbao, United must beat their opponents by three clear goals to reach the semi-finals of the European Cup. I remember thinking, oh, this is... This is paradise, you know. But I was so in involved in trying to get the three goals like everybody else. And it, I mean, it was deafening. Four minutes before half-time, Manchester's Violet goes through and it's a goal! The cheering was unbelievable. And the way the team played, oh, it was fantastic. Tommy Taylor, that was Tommy Taylor's finest night. I'm telling you, it was Tommy Taylor's finest night. And they all admitted that if they wanted a breather, they booted up to poor old Tommy. Taylor gives Carmelo a bump, but Atletico de Bilbao are renowned as a cracked Spanish eleven, and we were glad we weren't defending the Manchester goal. Manchester second came from a free kick, Taylor doing the rest. But Tommy Taylor made the goal for the last one, and he got the third goal. And you, everybody was jumping and crying, and grabbing each other, and hugging each other, and you lived on that for months, it kept you buzzing. You didn't need the, a drug like they have to, they need cocaine, all that today. That was the drug for you. That was the drug, seeing a wonderful team of these young lads all coming together and playing a wonderful game. So simple. Bill Bow was the night of nights for the Busby Babes. But in the semi-final, 
they narrowly lost to Real Madrid. Playing abroad had been wonderful, a great success. Everybody enjoyed it, Matt, the players and the supporters. No one doubted that next year they could go all the way. But safety in the air was beyond their control. Back in Bilbao, there had been an omen of the disaster to come. The match itself was played in a snowstorm on a very uh, muddy surface, you know, with, 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 with snow that tended to thaw straight away. And when we came to take off, the aircraft was covered in ice, snow, and uh, the pilot wouldn't take off until we had swept the wings. They were given sweeping brushes to, uh, to sweep the wings and, and to help sweep the ice and snow off the runway. We knew that we had to be back because the league would have been down on the club and, and on the players. You know, we don't know whether they'd have been suspended, fined or what for not getting back to fulfil the fixtures. It was treated as a big joke, you know, everybody was laughing and smiling, let's say, all right, skipper, and all that kind of thing. We were up, I was on the top of the thing, brushing it with Eddie and Bob um, Duncan, and we were, you know, we, we actually cleared the, the, all the snow and ice off the, off the wings. We didn't think anything of it at the time, but I think it was exactly a year before the Munich crash. Nearly sure it was. And that's where the photograph comes from, of all the players with the sweeping brushes 